It is my understanding we do have coffee being made. Um, Brian needs it today, I think. My name is Stephanie Surratt, and I want to say thank you so much for taking time, because I'm sure there's a million other things that you could be doing this morning. So I'm glad you could join us um, in our Southwest Virginia Regional Business Roundtable finale. Uh, today makes number 34. We've held 34 roundtables throughout Southwest Virginia, with the majority of those being held in the coal fields, from three to four per county, and collecting a whole lot of information that we're going to be sharing with you today, and ending the day at lunch um, on, you know, really deciding some bold steps to move forward. I'm from Southwest Virginia and proud to be so, and want to continue being here, as well as my children and my grandchildren. So that's why I know that that's why we all do what we do every single day. Um, is because we want to continue that. Because we are together, and I am so thankful, for lunch today, we are having a full Thanksgiving spread for lunch, um, thanks to the shack. So um, it is, and I am very thankful, and we should be giving a lot of thanks for what we do have, and, uh, and pray for those that we do not. So we are going to get started, um, and I'm going to first bring up David Hughes with the Appalachian Regional Commission. Um, the HART Project is funded with an ARC Power Grant awarded in January 2017, and a little bit later we're going to hear some actual impact uh, from the HARP project. But I do want to emphasize that we had three primary partners on our grant application, uh, the New River Mount Rogers Workforce Development Board, Southwest Virginia Workforce Development Board, and Gen Edge. And then throughout the couple of years that we've been working on this project, we have partnered with anybody that would partner with us. Leveraging those resources and services that are already here, such as PTAC, the Small Business Development Centers, the community colleges, it really just depended on what the company needed, and that's the direction that we went. So to do our official welcome, I'd like to bring David Hughes to the podium. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to the Workforce Investment Boards and the Gen Edge Alliance. So on behalf of ARC federal co-chairman Tim Thomas and our 13 governor state partners, I'd like to welcome you to this last uh, business roundtable, 34th. Stephanie, is that yes, real? That's it's a pleasure to be invited to this one. Much less actually being able to attend, but uh, I do like to extend our welcome from those folks and uh, Governor Northam's uh, state representative to the commission is Eric Johnson from the Department of Housing and Community Development. I think he's going to be able to join us during lunch, so we're looking forward to, to seeing him there. Uh, the short amount of time I have here, I just want to mention a couple of things. I can't talk about everything we're invested in, but Stephanie did mention this is a power project. It's our large initiative focused on assisting the businesses and the communities that have been impacted by the decline in coal production. And we also have our regular 365 day a year program, which Eric oversees at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, some of the things that we're doing, uh, especially of late, is that we have a new focus on and a renewed focus on substance abuse disorder. And Stephanie's agreed to serve on a council to advise us on how to do that. Uh, she, we consider her representative of manufacturing and a representative of the Commonwealth. And so Stephanie, we owe you big thanks for that in addition to the great work you're doing here on the Heart Project. The other thing that I just, I've got to mention is how excited I am. It, the work and our investments that we're making in manufacturing, this is the first time really in 22 years of me being at the commission that I've been able to say this, we're doing some of the most remarkable and innovative things for investing in this program. We don't actually do it, I don't, you know, obviously don't do it myself. But we all just want to mention some of the things around you that we're doing in Western North Carolina, there's a group of a consortium of 35 outdoor recreational equipment manufacturers that have organized and we're working with them to create new MBA programs focused on the outdoor recreation industry, the workforce development, bringing access to capital to those folks. The grantee on that project is actually a, a CDFI lender of Mount Bizworks. Uh, of course, we got the Manufacturing Demonstration Center at Oak Ridge National Labs in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is a world-class facility up in southwestern Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. We're working on, it, we're bringing Industry 4.0, smart manufacturing or digital manufacturing to the communities up there, to the, to the businesses that are uh, parts of the coal supply chain. And we're actually, as you 
well aware we're on the verge of a virtual explosion in supply chain uh, manufacturing related to the shale energy sector. We just held a webinar on May 16th, focusing on that. And that's, of course, brought about in part by the construction of the ethane cracker up at Weaver, which is north of Pittsburgh. So we're doing some great things. And this is the first time in the 22 years I've been there that I really can say that I'm excited about the future of manufacturing in the region. You guys have been out there doing it, toiling away the whole time, I know. And if, if we've overlooked you at times, I'll apologize for that. We're very uh, focused on improving uh, what we do to interact with you and to help to provide you with anything that we can to help you do your jobs. Stephanie's work is a great example of that. I can't, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to you, Stephanie, for putting this program together. And I just want to thank you once again and also just welcome you from all those folks. Our 13 governors are represent our state partners in the region. They are in line with ARC every step of the way. We're truly a federal state partnership. And we're just very happy to be here to engage through folks like Stephanie and the uh, Southwest Virginia Alliance for Manufacturing. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to the next person. Mr. Hughes, uh, we very much appreciate the NRC's investment in this, this project and, and what it's been able to accomplish so far. Uh, we're hoping that the uh, impacts will be long term and long lasting. How's everybody doing today? Right, right, right. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Sunshine, <laughs> right? Even when it comes down, there's water droplets, right? The sun never stops shining. What is it that I normally do when I start a session? Anybody know? Anybody tell me? What's the first thing I ask people to do? Go around and introduce yourself. Yes, and what else? What do I ask for? What we're thankful Something for. positive that happened to you already today, right? Well, the room's too big for that. So we're not going to try that this morning. But I will tell you something positive that happened to me today. Because I was able to get here. I'm not exactly on time. I was late, of course. But uh, I was able to get here, and we were able to get set up, and all of you all showed up. So, wow. Uh, I really do appreciate you being willing to, to, to show up and, and be here today. Yes, okay. Uh, Stephanie tells me that we do have coffee. This is intended to be a very relaxed atmosphere. Uh, it's intended to be uh, you know, a, a lot of back and forth and discussion. Feel free to get up. Do whatever you need to do. Get coffee. Uh, restrooms are straight back through the back doors here, across the hall, uh, if you need those. There's also some down this hall if you, if you need them. Um, and if you need to um, make a phone call, uh, probably best to step out of the room, but you know, no worries. Uh, if you need to do a text, well, that's, that's cool too. So what I wanted to start off with today is ask a question. Why are you here? Does anybody want to tell me why they're here? Why we're here? Yes. I want to find here? out what everybody else is doing to see if we're right with them. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Anna, can you help me with this? Thank you. Anybody else want to tell me why you're here? So far we've had one response and that's I'm here because I want to find out what everybody else is doing and see if we're with them. Yeah? I'm, I'm here to, to learn how we can grow our company, Blue Wolf, and uh, try to expand and use every uh, every uh, option we have within the government and, and the county and the state and, and, uh, in order to grow. Okay, great. Stephanie, you want to tell me why you're here? I'm here because I love, love, love Southwest Virginia, and whatever I can do to help move forward with whoever's willing to jump on the crazy train with me, I'm ready to ride. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. I'm right there with you. I'm on the crazy train right there with you. So we're, we're riding that together. Well, we did a lot of these, uh, Stephanie mentioned. Uh, this is the 34th one. Um, it's a lot of time, energy, and effort that you all put in. 
Can I get everybody to stand up that has been attended uh, or uh, participated in one of the business roundtables? Everybody stand up. Do you all? You all feel the same way? Absolutely. I think you do. You're here. 
right? You're here. So we went through a process with these business rounds. Like, well, I'm going to kind of go through that, walk through that process very quickly with you. We started out with defining where we are, talking about strengths, problems, opportunities, and threats, okay? We considered the current regional structure and the regional context. We looked at new entrants into the region's markets, into the region's industries. We talked about regional growth opportunities. We talked about trends and inhibitors that are impacting how we grow or how we're not growing. We examined some of the areas that impact our regional growth. Then we use these maps. And if you've been to one of the business round tables, you've seen them. They're the spot matrix, the industry structure map, the, the, the context map, solution maturity curve. Is everybody familiar with the solution maturity curve? If you've been to a business round table, or at least one of the early ones, you've seen it, right? So basically what happens on the solution maturity curve? Where would our region fall on the solution maturity curve? And yes, we do have some bright spots. We have some very, very bright spots. And I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. I just wanted to kind of kick things off with you all thinking about why you're here. Why would you spend your valuable time to come down to talk to everyone, to be a part of figuring out some bold steps, be a part of talking about the vision, talking about our opportunities and what we can do every single day to improve where we're going. I took this picture, and anybody knows me, they know I'm, I'm really a nerd. <laughs> I'm a geek. I love technology. I love techie stuff. I was driving down, well, I was stopped on the interstate, we'll say. <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I looked out and I saw these two aircraft taking off from the airport there uh, below Withhold, there in Little Retreat. And I thought, oh, one day soon, one day soon, this is going to be, that sky's going to be much fuller of those type of aircraft, probably a lot smaller than those. I think those were Ospreys. I think that's the aircraft that takes off vertical with the, the blades and then they rotate and they fly from there. So, but I thought, wow, wow, things are changing. And we talked about the innovation cycle, right? And I've talked a lot about autonomous vehicles, uh, how they are coming, and they're already here. I saw a commercial the other day for, I think it was a Cadillac that had the full steering. Your hand did not have to be on the steering wheel in order for the, for the car to steer itself. It's like Tesla, they require your hand to be on the steering wheel. Cadillac, no. It'll steer itself, it'll drive itself. Those autonomous vehicles are coming very, very quickly. But how long is that innovation going to last? It's not going to last that long, is it? Because drones, personal drones, personal flying machines are on the way. And they're already real. People already have them and fly them, right? There's some that have been in place and been flown for thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. So that innovation cycle is already here. What are we doing to innovate our region with it? <coughs> I've got to pick up the pace a little bit. The next step in the process was looking forward. What do we want to become? What does our region see itself as? Do we see ourselves as communities that have a value that's 30% less than the rest of the state. Because if we do, we're never going to change where we're at. If we see our value as 30% less than the rest of the state, we're never going to change. But I don't think we do. I think that we see our value, we just don't know how to get that value out there. So we've got to work on that. Next. We're going to talk about vision themes, vision of our future. Our panelists who, who are here today, uh, they're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about their vision. Um, next, what can we do to realize that future? What are some bold steps? What are some things that we can actually do? Actions that we can take? 
you know, we could go to, say, you know, ARC, please continue to give us money, money to get us out of this hole. Please continue to give us money. But who has to make that happen? It's on us, right? We are the ones who have to be that change. We can't expect someone else to come in with something else and to change us. We're the ones that have to change ourselves. So we'll talk about some bold steps. And then we'll go on into, you know, how do we actually accomplish those bold steps as we close out today. We'll talk about game plan. You know, what is the game plan? How do, who needs to be involved? Who needs to take a lead? Who all needs to be partners in the bold steps to start moving us forward? Okay? So we'll get to that. And that consists of the journey vision map. The value proposition, we'll talk some about our value proposition or competitive advantage, as you'll see it later. We'll talk about five bold steps, but we have a bunch of bold steps. And you'll see how many bold steps we collected. And then we'll talk about the game plan. You know, how do we move, how do we move those bold steps forward? So we started with the, the strengths, opportunities, problems, and threats. And I'll just quickly go through some of these. We talked about some of our strengths, work ethic. And I think that we probably have one of the strongest work ethics, ethics that there are in the U.S. Um, we talked about a lot of diverse businesses, um, our existing businesses, a strong manufacturing base. We talked about a strong moral and ethical um, values. We talked about experienced workforce. We talked about having a lot of room to grow. Let me ask you a question. If we got a company in one of the counties in southwest Virginia that employed 500 people, do we have the labor force today to fill that company that's available? No way. No way. No way. Without taking from one of our existing businesses? So we need to think about it. As we move forward, we need to think about it. what do we have the capacity to do. We talked about good agriculture land, strong history and culture. We had a lot of strengths, and these were very common across the region. Most of these showed up in almost every single one of the um, localities that we use around the region. We had some problems. One of the problems that showed up was what I just mentioned, focusing on landing the big businesses. Um, we talked about having a very strong resistance, resistance to change, right? I mean, how many people in here, raise your hand, love change? How many people love change? There's not a lot of hands going up, and they didn't go up really, really quick either. But I agree, I love change. It creates variety, it creates that spice of life for me, and I love it. But we do have a tendency to get comfortable where we are, right? To get focused on what's in front of us, and not think about what's going to happen in five years. So what happened to Kodak? Anybody know what happened to Kodak? Yeah, digital cameras came out, didn't they? And what happened? It killed their business. It killed their business. What's currently happening to Sears and Kmart? They didn't have the vision to see what was coming. And that's what we got to be thinking about. we got to be thinking about what's coming, not about what's right in front of us. Because with that innovation cycle being so quick and so short, how could we possibly react in time to actually be competitive if, it's actually, if the problem is actually occurring now? Because somebody out there is thinking about that future already, right? So that's change that we need to be thinking about for our region. We have a resistance to change. We have a, a tendency to want to stick where we're at and not 
look forward and not reach forward. So we need to think about how can we change that? How can we as a region begin <coughs> to make those changes that are required so that we think differently? We talked about lack of capital. Uh, we talked about you know, educational challenges. We had a lot of discussion around educational challenges. We talked about a negative mindset, uncertainty. We talked about the outside perspective of how we are. Us hillbillies. Right? Appalachian people. And we don't like the way other people look at how we are. But do we look at ourselves that same way? And if we do, are we partially responsible for that? When I look at, back at, at my time, and I'm proud to be from where I'm from. I'm proud to be a hillbilly. But sometimes we create that perspective that other people have. So we need to think about that as we move forward. My clicker here. So we have some problems that we need to work on. We have some threats. Apathy, resistance to change again, dependency and uh, drug abuse, uh, prescription drug abuse, um, challenges with that addiction that sometimes holds people back, right? But you know, I was in Georgia earlier this week, and I looked at the front page of the Brunswick paper, and they were talking about how bad it was that those opioids were in our community and how it was killing their community. So it's not just us. So we don't need to look at it as just being a problem we have. It's not an inhibitor. It's not something that should hold us back. We have other threats. Global competition, cybersecurity, lots of threats around those things. Lots and lots of opportunities. If you notice, there's a lot more opportunities than they were strengths, problems, or threats. Right? So people have a vision. They want to see where we can go. They think there's a lot of opportunity here. But we talked about things like rare earth elements, right? As a potential opportunity. We talked about graphene as being a potential opportunity. We talked about cybersecurity as being a, a, an opportunity. We talked about things like expanding uh, our computer education in the high schools and beyond. Not just what we do today, right? We don't need to just teach our kids what we do today because in five years, we don't even know what the jobs are going to look like. So how do we prepare our kids for that? How do you prepare your kids for something, a job that you don't even, it doesn't even exist today? Well, what do all jobs have in common? All jobs really do require critical thinking. They require problem solving skills. They require some of those crucial skills that a lot of times we missed because things have changed in our educational system and we focused on tests. And that came out. A lot of people talked about challenges with the SOLs. I did not have one person raise their hand and say, we love the S SOLs. I didn't have one person say even one positive thing about the SOLs. And so I go back in my mind and I'm saying the SOLs have been around since the mid-90s. And we're still doing them? And they're, nobody has anything positive to say about them? Why? Because change is hard, right? Change is hard. But we have to start thinking outside the box. I saw some incredibly bright spots in our education system. One, Dickinson County, wow. They have a robotics team, competed internationally. That's pretty awesome, right? We had folks in Lee County that did some of the very first Captain the Flag events in all of Southwest Virginia, in the high school, in Lee County. Wow. Bright spots. How do we spread them? Those are the things we need to work on and figure out. New entrants, artificial intelligence. Wow. I heard the other day creativity is something that they think artificial intelligence can be sure come up with. 
I never thought they would get there. Creativity? Really? That's what, they, that's what I heard in a, in a report the other day. Drug-based services, hydro pump storage, transportation logistics, uh, manufacturing, craft beers, wines, uh, those types of things. Agriculture and hemp products. Uh, the Vesita Entrepreneurship Seed Company uh, was included in that. Uh, we've also had discussions around Tobacco Commission and a lot of the funding that they put into the region. We had discussions around uh, the Virginia Community Capital and a lot of the efforts that they're putting in to help companies to access capital to look at that long-term innovation. Thing. So we had some trends. A lot of big data is being collected. We had alternative energy as a trend. Adding manufacturing. And all of these are in the big, there's, there's a one copy that covers everything. Everybody else's copy is kind of high level. But this, I think this is actually everybody's copy. Uh, so you'll have copies of this that you can look at. But I just kind of want to bring you up to date as to where we are. You know, what do we have as, as inhibitors? Generational dependency. Is that a problem for us? What do you think? Okay. We well, do have a challenge with that. Well, let's back up a little bit. Now, I'm not, I don't mean to say anything that steps on anybody's toes. And I'm sorry if I do. I apologize up front if I, if I hurt anybody's feelings, okay? Because I don't mean to do that, but I want to be very straightforward and honest. We have qualified for low to moderate income grants, high poverty level grants, for decades. Decades. What's the difference? What's the difference? Between the generational dependency and the dependency our region has had on this outside fund. My goal, my hope, my dream for my kids is that we will be a whole. Our region will be a whole in the map that shows communities that qualify for those low to moderate income, uh, that low to moderate income funding, that poverty level funding. I hope one day that we no longer qualify for that. And I don't know why we can't. Absolutely. I don't understand Absolutely. why we cannot get there. And I, I go back in my mind, and I spent a lot of years uh, doing a lot of different things um, and did some work around in and around economic development. And I look back and I think, if I had it to do all over again, I would do a lot of things very differently. I would. I really would. Because who's here? The companies that have been here for a long, long time for the most part. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, I think we're ready to move on into the next piece. They report back growth in sales, money saved, etc. Total monetary impact of 10 companies, and we have provided direct services for over 50, so there's still 40 some companies to collect these studies from. But does anyone want to guess what the monetary impact has been? Except for those people that I've already shared it with, because I'm so excited I can't keep a secret. But I can rattle that <laughs> So, what kind of guess? Our grants were 1.3 million, and it was a match of well over two. We have leveraged every dollar from every partner that we probably could. But with that much of the investment, a 1.3 million dollar grant kind of driving it from 10 companies, what do you think is the monetary impact so far? Guesses, come on, let's go. Guesses. 20 million. 20 million. More. 30 million. How much? 30. More. 50. More. Hundreds? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, uh, 86 million dollars monetary impact from these two We've done almost 200 new jobs and almost 300 jobs saved. That's our actual goal for our whole project. And that's only from 10 companies. And we work with over 50. Um, we've got over 500 in attendance at the round tables, with over 200 companies participating. 
So, and I think the secret is, these folks up here, we all do what we do every day. Nothing different when we do it. But what we did approach differently is we let them lead us what they needed. The heart money was about paying for technical assistance for businesses to get what they need to transition in a way that they can move back toward profitability. An assessment where we learn what they, where they are, where they want to go, and then we chart the path on how to get there. So they let us existing business. 1.3 million, and we probably invested in those 10 companies maybe 200,000, I'm being generous. $86 million monetary impact. So our panelists, we have Don, Donald Purdy, who is with Norrisville Fabrication. Dr. Steve Cooper, um, he's with the Graphene Research Center, but his company's name is Carbon Research and Development Company. Todd Ellswick with Paul's Fan Company in Buchanan County. We have Nellie Pony Lawrence with Mark Lawrence Brothers in Tazewell County. And Roberta or Robin Lee with RL Structural. And uh, Sansa Monterey. Okay, as we get started, uh, you'll see on the screen the journey vision. Okay, we're going to start talking about the vision now. And there was a great deal that people talked about as being part of their vision, right? Uh, you'll all get a copy of the full report by uh, PDF. We'll be sending that to you uh, in your email. But what we, what I asked after the roundtables was, if you had a magic wand. And you could cause our region to be anything you wanted it to be in five years. What would that look like? What would that be? So that's how we capture the vision. We talked about the guiding principles and values. You know, what is it that actually guides the way we interact and come about attaining that vision? What are our guardrails, so to speak, in the way that we do things? And then we talked about the mission. And to me, that mission was, what am I going to get up every day? Me, every day. What am I going to get up? What am I going to do that's going to help us as a region accomplish that vision? Because I have to take responsibility for myself. Years ago, I told some folks that I work with, you know, we can't change the world overnight, but we can change the world one person at a time. And that starts with me, right? Starts with changing ourselves. So we need to be thinking about that. As the panelist, I would like for you to introduce yourselves. I'll we'll start on this end with Robin. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you envision for the region and how that ties to the vision for your business. My name is Robin Lee, and I'm with all that special engineering. I'm sorry, I talked about that. <laughs> My name is Robin Lee, and I'm with RL Structural Engineering, and we are a very small engineering firm here in uh, Southwest Virginia, basically in Tazewell County. And we started because of the decline in coal, and our, our vision is to provide engineering services for all the companies here, mainly, and help us all grow. And that's what I'd like us to see, is that we all learn what each other does and see if we can help each other grow and work together um, to, to make that good because I'm sure I can help any folks in this room with, with designs of, of different things or at least folks in touch with people that can physically grow the business so that we all can, can become more profitable. My name is Melanie Crowley Lawrence and I'm with Lawrence Brothers in Louisville, Virginia. Uh, we've been in business for 46 years. My husband and I are third generation owners. My grandfather started the business only to do coal mining related work. Um, when we came to Bluefield 13 years ago, came back to Bluefield 13 years ago, we were still 97% coal mining related. So we knew something had to change. Um, fast forward uh, uh, more than a decade and we're now less than 50% coal mining related. And yes, that was intentional. Um, so, you know, we're just looking to diversify and I'd like to, as a vision for the region, I'd like to see the region as a whole focus on diversification and stop living in the past. Um, you know, coal's never going to be where it was before, but there are new, uh, there are innovations out there, there are new energy sources out there, and so we need to diversify. Um, I would like to see us work 
better together as a community, as a, as a region, and collaborate rather, rather than compete. Um, I think that, that that's really the heart of it, is that we have to collaborate. And I would like to see us become self-sufficient, and, and like Sam mentioned, not, um, not rely on all of the, the government help while that you know, is definitely useful and we can, we can grow in, as a community, as a region, using that. Uh, we need to work to become self-sufficient and stand on our own, our own feet. My name is Todd Elswick. Uh, I'm the owner of Paul's Fans in Big Rock, Virginia. I'm determined to get that on the map. Um, our company is going in on our 62nd year in business now. It was originated and started by my father. And too, like many other companies, we were 100% uh, devoted to coal for most of that time, maybe for 50 years of our company, 99 to 100% of what we did was directly related with coal. Since that time, uh, we started looking at other areas and we noticed that you know, there was other mining, of course, that went with ventilation. And we had started uh, moving in that direction before the turn in 2012, 2013. And uh, I too, we saw some numbers in 2016 that was staggering to us, and that was for the first time ever, we were about 50% other markets than coal. And when that was brought to my attention, it was, uh, I didn't know that would be possible. However, I can say that if we had not started our diversification years before, and if we were not ready for that when that happened, that 2016 would have probably been a year that we would have went out of business after 60 years worth of, worth of work. So that, that diversification absolutely came just in time. I'm still thankful to my God for that. I'd be working for one of you fellows today. Uh, and, but, and since that time, uh, we have acquired a couple of different companies. Uh, some of you uh, may recognize the company of Jeffrey Manufacturing. Uh, Jeffrey was one of the very leaders in underground coal mining equipment. We bought that company from Caterpillar in 2014, and then just recently in 2016, we bought a company out of Illinois that was called Champion. Champion Forge and Blower Company. So in that diversification that has helped us into other markets, into the industrial sector and ventilation, and it has helped us tremendously. Uh, even Sam, uh, you need to know this, as I sat down at the table, Melanie said, you're in the fan business. I said, yes. She said, well, we had a fan that went out yesterday. Could you help us with that? That, that was pretty cool. So uh, that was, I never, I never uh, ceased to be amazed of uh, the places that, that ventilation fans are used and what they do. So that's a little bit of brag on, on the business. The next part is my business. Uh, I too have children. Uh, my wife and I have six children and five grandbabies so far. I tell them that I hope that they could be at least half as good as their mother and I. They could all have three, so that'd be 18 grandbabies. <laughs> so that's, what, that's one of the things I'm looking for. I've, I've decided that I too, as my father, like my grandchildren way better than my <laughs> So, um, <laughs> amen, I got one of those in the and, and it seems like they like me better than my grandchildren. <laughs> Well, there may be a reason for that, um, but but I certainly do, do enjoy that, and uh, my wife and I are also fortunate enough to be a little bit linked to the area of Pigeon Forge, where we have some cabins there that we rent. I've always been a fan of Dolly Park. Always been a fan of Dolly Park my whole life. I've watched her, uh, and I find her to be a wonderful human being. And one of the things that Dolly Parton will quote, in any interview you see, and even after the fires down there, and, and the help
help that she rendered and gave to her community, and, and she would qualify that always as, that's my people. That's my people. I'm interested in Southwest Virginia. I'm interested in Buckhannon County. I'm interested in the people who work for me now because they are my people. They're my family. They're my friends. They're who I attend church with. That's who I would like to see have the same opportunities as we do over on the other side of, of our state and, and of our nation. I'd like to see that. So that's one of the reasons that I was uh, agreed to be on this panel. That's one of the reasons that uh, I want to be involved with the Heart Project and all the things that we are working with with our business is an amazing opportunity. So thank you for that. Hello, I'm Steve Oper and I'm the uh, CEO of the EnviroCarbon Companies, which is a uh, set of companies that uh, manufacture all types of sophisticated, what's called high-end carbons. Uh, I started off in the coal business. I got into the coal business in 1969, and they got that old uh, <laughs> And I've got grandkids and great-grandkids. So uh, I've been around a long time. My whole life was uh, involved around the coal business in some fashion. Uh, and we did a lot of other things along the way as we prospered in the coal business, but, but still yet my whole life revolved around coal. And when coal started to fail, uh, and I knew that for the first time I was willing to admit that it probably was never going to be what it had been. When that happened, uh, I began to, the first thing is I, I got depressed about the whole thing. Because I thought, you know, I really don't know much else other than the coal business and things to do with the coal business. Uh, and so uh, that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is I began to get determined to take what I had learned in the coal business and, and put it to use in, in other areas. And so I come to find out that I really had learned an awful lot in the coal business. The coal business will educate you. Uh, somebody asked me why, uh, why would we be here in Southwest Virginia? Why did we consolidate offices? We closed offices in uh, uh, Daytona Beach, Florida, and Charleston, South Carolina, and North Corner, South Carolina, Kingsport, Tennessee, and, and loaded up uh, 37 tractor trailer loads and 18 uh, van loads of stuff and moved up here to Wise, Virginia. Why would we do that? Well, it really has more to do with people than anything else. Because I know what kind of people Wise has. And I know what kind of people this area has, Southwest Virginia, and this whole mountain region. And I know that the coal business has taught folks a lot of things they don't even know yet. I hear an awful lot about education, about educating these people. Well, you know, I found out something about these folks, you all. You can educate them. I watched a lot of smart people come and go in the coal business. I watched them walk away shaking their heads, wondering how they got out of smart by somebody who didn't get out of the third grade. I watched uh, people that work very hard and are so innovative, they don't have a degree, never will have, don't really care about one, but they know how to do things. That's what this place is all about to me. I don't, I don't see that we are a uh, lesser people because we live in a mountain region and we've been based around coal. We have learned an awful lot from the coal business and I will, I will venture to say that you like I have learned an awful lot about things that you don't even know you've learned if you've been in the coal business. The coal business is a great teacher. Um, and so we have, uh, uh, we developed from that knowledge, we uh, stayed kind of in the same field, carbon, those carbon, so, so we stayed in the same field. But we went, my wife, in fact, my wife heard me when we first started this business, my wife heard me on a call, and when I got off the call, she said, who are you and what have you done with my husband? <laughs> uh, because I was talking about all these green things. Uh, the only thing I ever talked about green but had been to the Franklin's picture. So, uh, so she was she thought I lost my mind because I was uh, uh, turned into a green person. Um, 
but we decided that we would get into the carbon business and um, and we would do that from wood. And so we were fortunate enough to invent a process called the environmentalization process, which takes weed biomass and converts it to a substance that we can make like coal or like a lot of other things. But, but it, we make a lot of sophisticated carbons that had never been made from wood before. I learned all of that in the COVID. Every bit of it. And so when we came up with the idea to, to uh, do what we're doing, I knew the basis of it because I knew the coal came from wood, uh, basically comes from biomass, and been put under compression over a long period of time. And so we accelerated that and, and developed a process to mimic that. And all of that came from what I learned in the coal business. In fact, what I do every day, dealing with people, Raising money, whatever we have to do, we we should invest a tremendous amount of money in in what we do, and uh, we have uh, uh, we have learned how to do even that from the COVID. And I thought we might be done for uh, about several years ago because I was just so tired of uh, uh, the business failing in terms of co business, and and it just seemed like we had nothing. No hope left, no, none of those things. But you know, our hope is in uh, minds in, in uh, God and His ability in us. And in you all, I'm telling you, you've got great, there are great resources here. Great resources. We don't need, I mean, I'm fine to bring in experts, but you know what? Experts leave with your money, and their knowledge. Uh, there's this old adage that says when, a, when somebody that's a, a, a an expert uh, in, a, in a field comes up against somebody with money. When the deal's over, the guy with the money has become an expert, and the guy with the experts got the money. And so, um, so we don't. We're, uh, I think, more educated than we think we are. We're more equipped than we think we are as, as mountain folk. And, and I'm really an importer. I come from Nashville, but but I came here in 1973 or something. So, so I've been in the area for. But I, I know that, that what you all got is, uh, is more than you know. It's just more than you know. And, and I think that it's time that we stood up as uh, not looking for a handout from folks, but looking how to give a hand up to folks. And if you give, you will receive. It's just the way it works. It's the way the plan's set up. And so uh, I just encourage uh, you got, uh, you all are blessed. It's a blessed region. The blessed resources, blessed people, uh, character, you got uh, raised in, in an environment that the rest of the country doesn't even know about with values and all those kind of things. And so uh, we just, we're excited to be here. We, uh, we're looking for great things out of, out of our companies based here and, and the things that we can do with you all. And, and uh, But I'm not up here to tap that. I'm here to encourage you that, that listen, I'm telling you, you guys need to be the ones that's wagging the tail, not being wagged by it. And so uh, uh, we're, we're really uh, uh, equipped here to do great, great, great things. And, and uh, I want to thank you for having me here today. I'm Donald Purdy. I'm with Data Insurance Incorporated. Even though it says I'm with Northfield, I've been working with Northfield now for about six months and uh, working with them pretty steadily. Um, we'll give you a background about Northfield Fabrication so you can kind of get an idea what what uh, a gem this is in our region. We, uh, Ron Norris started the company about five years ago. He started out with an idea of, of jack stands. He saw an opportunity uh, or a situation where people were getting hurt. So he came up with an, an idea. And he made it. He made it. And he got a patent. He just got the patent just about a month ago. And just about the time that he was getting ready to go into a big production of those, he got the rug pulled out from underneath the coal market <laughs> downhill. But that didn't stop him because he thought, well, okay, that's just one thing. There's many other things. So he started diversifying. And what he didn't realize was that he wasn't supposed to diversify and be as successful as he has been as quickly as he has been because he's not supposed to do that. Nobody bothered to tell him that. So he did. Now he's got a pretty good company going in Norton. Uh, got uh, about 40 people working there now. Uh, fabricate just about anything uh, that you can think of. Uh, and it's more than just fabrication as well. It's design. He's 
he's, uh, they, there's a sign up there in one of the offices that says the welder is an engineer's best friend. And I believe that to be true if you stop thinking about it. But uh, Ron has, has grown that business quite, quite handy and uh, has made good progress with that. And how I met Ron was through a friend of mine about five years ago when, when Ron was first getting started. And I'm on that. Kept checking in with Ron throughout the years because I also have my background in railway. I started out with working for Southern Railway back way back when, uh, and uh, worked for them for a while. Started a computer company, consulting business, that sort of thing. Got back into railroads, and for about four and a half years, I was going out to Washington State most of the time running a four-mile railroad. So, and I can tell you that people in quote flyover country, which is what I would classify us. We're all got pretty much the same outlook. We really do. The only difference between the people here and in Washington State, and I'm talking about the eastern side of the state, not the nutty left, I'm talking about the eastern side of the state. Uh, they just have a funny accent. That's, that's the only thing they've got. They don't have a good accent. I mean, seriously, that's the only. Uh, they don't drink sweet tea, and I have yet to figure that out. <laughs> I was working on that, but anyway. Uh, but, but people are, uh, they are just, just it reminded me of, of here, it really did. And I was, that, was, it was, that was really stuck with me. And so the, the work ethics and the value of the people out in Washington and where I was, just like here. And it, it, was, a, it was, I won't say Iowa, because it wasn't a surprise that we have a good work ethic here. And everybody in Southwest Virginia wants a job, got it. That, I mean, I think that's pretty good. Everybody in here, does anybody in here have a problem finding people to work? <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least one. We, everybody has a problem finding somebody to work because of some other issues that we'll get into later. But, but the work ethic for everybody that wants to work is phenomenal. Like Dr. Hooper said, uh, you take somebody and, and just, you just give them a little leeway and come up with a lot of great ideas and fix a lot of things that you would just think well, that, that's, that's not going to fix and yet they do it, and they do it all the time. And it's just, it's just raw ingenuity, not necessarily formal ingenuity. And sometimes I think formal ingenuity kind of gets in the way, because you find yourself in boxes. You got walls up. You think, well, I can't do that because of this. And those walls need to come down. We need to start thinking way outside of these walls. Get rid of the boxes that we're in. Think about where we want to be, and figure out a path to get there. And you know, it's just like when your cell phone breaks, your computer breaks, you used to have to take it somewhere and somebody fix it for you. Now you just give it to your grandkids. Because they don't understand that they're not supposed to push that button. Because every time we get ready to push it, go, oh, gosh, what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, am I going to lose everything? And they go, yeah, here we go. And they push the button, and next thing you know, it's fixed. Because they don't have all those preconceived walls on. And I think that that's a barrier that we need to overcome. And, and we can overcome. Because again, it's that raw ingenuity that, that's in this area. So, uh, with that, I'll give it back to Sam. Thank you all um, for your, your vision for what you want to see the region be. Um, I'm going to cover very quickly uh, just some high level vision themes that we collected at the Business Roundtable. Um, we had vision themes around regional economic development. We had regional educational uh, vision themes, regional employment vision themes, regional business uh, vision themes, technology innovation, youth or generational things to do, community-based vision themes, uh, health vision themes, people, growth, collaborative, and infrastructure. Those were the basically the, the high-level vision themes that came out as we, we talked through. So, as we discussed, the regional economic uh, vision, a, a diversified economy, right? We love the coal industry. The coal industry has supported us for many, many years, but it's always been volatile. It's always had ups and downs. And it will this time as well. And if we're honest with ourselves, for our region, that coal industry, even though it's had its ups and downs, has been on a gradual decline for a long, long time. So we do need to look at diversifying. And that's really what this Park project was about. It was about getting companies 
to look outside of their normal markets within the coal industry and embrace markets that were outside. We talked about you know, surrounding counties you know, having uh, a mission and leadership and experiences an increasing population, right? We saw that one slide where the population is continuing to decrease. How long has it been since we actually had region-wide, I'm not talking about bright spots here and there, but region-wide since we actually had an increase in population? How many years? Can anybody remember? 50s? That's a long, long time. Why? We have a beautiful place to live. We have an incredible quality of life. Why are we losing population? We need to think about that. There has to be a reason why. And there has to be a way to reverse that trend, right? So let's think, let's think about that. We'll talk about that in a little more. We talked about economically having a booming economy. And right now, in our region, for the most part, is our economy booming? I mean, we're talking about people not being able to find the employees they need. That's a boom, right? If I've ever seen a boom, I've never seen. I think uh, I added up the jobs along the one quarter from Bristol to uh, Radford area, and it was somewhere around 4,000 open jobs that they were having job fairs for. 4,000 open jobs. How long has it been since we've had that? So when should we start working on what we're going to do next? Now, right? We have opportunity now. We have the finances, we have the means now to start working on that. So we need to look at that. We talked about uh, diversified, innovative, uh, growing economy, uh, leading the Southeast in development. What was that talking about? I think this was talking about innovation. This was talking about looking at doing things differently. And Dr. Hooper spoke at the Technology Council uh, last Thursday evening. And innovation doesn't necessarily mean electronics. It's simply finding a new way to do something in a different way, right? So there's a lot of innovation that we can be thinking about. And I've talked about this many times. You know, who is thinking about the attachments that people are going to want on their personal drone? Is the market there yet? No. But should we be thinking about that? We need to be thinking that way. You know, who's, who's thinking about, you know, I'll give you a personal example. My daughters, they can come up with some great ideas. Um, but they, and we could have used it on our trip, they wanted to, they talked about coming up with an app to actually identify clean restrooms along primary travel quarters, right? <laughs> So how many people would use that app? I know we would, you know? Is, is that restroom 15 miles out of the road? Well, I can wait till then because that one's going to be clean. So why don't we do those things? It, people are doing those things every single day. We have an incredible ability to solve problems here. We always have. So how do we get turn that into an entrepreneurial mindset where we're actually coming up with the solutions before the problems happen. Or we're actually having that vision to see what that's going to be. We talked about education. Uh, we talked about shifting our education to trade school center. Uh, and I we've seen a lot of that here recently. The question I have is, are we thinking about how that's going to change? With new materials? With different types of mill? With different ways of Building things, 3D house construction, 3D printing house construction. Are we thinking about those things? Are we thinking about how we can teach those things? Are we introducing those concepts to our children in the schools? And if we're not, we better be because they're coming. They're coming very quickly. Closer relationships between schools and businesses, and I'm hearing more and more about that happening every day. United Way has a great program going called Ignite. Uh, and we have some school systems that are just jumping in there and working for apprenticeship type programs as well. So that's great. Bright spots. 
UVA wide is 5,000 students. We have some incredible higher education centers uh, in, our, in our region. So. We talked about employment vision, full employment, the lowest unemployment in the state. Wow, that would be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, we already have pretty much full employment, and I think everybody in the state has that. But it would be nice whenever that economic shift comes, if we come out the other side of that with the lowest unemployment rate in the state. That would be cool. Why can't we do it? We can't. We can't. We just have to decide we will. But it's going to take collaboration. It's going to take collaboration. It's going to take working together. Jobs paying wages comparable to average state wage. That came up. Came up a couple of times. Let me ask a question. And I've asked this at several, if, if, and, and I don't mean it in a negative way. But if we always sell ourselves as a low wage area, oh, you can come here, bring your business here. You can pay our people less money to do the same job as any other place in the country. Are we ever going to change our low to moderate income standard that we, that we have? We want that changed, right? Are we ever going to change our poverty level? The answer to that is no, we're not. We're always going to be on that lower level. So how do we change that? How do we start looking at that? And I know that our businesses are thinking, especially today in the labor market we have, how do I make sure I keep my talent, right? Y'all have to think about that. And it sometimes it requires those increases. So what would it take for you to be able to increase the salary of your employees? Better profit margins? Better profit, more sales? More sales? Well, that's all that's connected together. So they need to grow their businesses in order to increase the wages, right? So how can we as a community, as a region, support growing their businesses? And I've seen some really, really good things happen. Uh, we have you know, programs that are being developed to help support existing businesses. Programs that are being put in place to help entrepreneurs get started and, and grow businesses. Those are all great, fantastic programs. And if it weren't for those type of programs and all the projects that we've done over the years, utilizing that funding that's been available to cause for the money, how much further behind would we be? We would be a whole lot further behind. Right? But we've got to figure out how not to be behind anymore. We've got to figure out how to jump over and get to the next level. And that's going to take everybody in this room. It's going to take a whole lot more than who's in this room. It's going to take your entire region coming together to do that. Uh, business vision. Businesses that com accommodate the generational differences, right? Uh, high growth and trade based businesses. Uh, stronger workforce, many more new jobs. Uh, employers that attract skilled workforce. Businesses looking forward to the next thing innovation. Technology vision, and I can go on about technology all day. I'm going to kind of bust through these. What do we all want? Youth and generational vision. There was one in here that I really loved. I'm not sure if it's in this list or not, but it was talking about there it is a broad range of generations supporting and serving each other. Wow. When I saw that one, I was like, man, that is exactly what we need. That is exactly what we need. We need young people, we need middle-aged people, we need old people, and we all need to be working to support and to serve one another, right? And I think that for the most part we try to do that. But we've got to figure out how to think forward because we are losing our young people. <coughs> you know, I heard a report just the other day, you know, great news, great news. 60% um, of the kids that go away to college uh, from rural areas will return to those rural areas. Bad news is, that was a 20 year study. So 20 years later, the kids came back, right? They went away, they made their way, made their living, and they came back. We wanted to stay here, we wanted to work here, right? 
So regional collaboration. And collaboration, what does that mean? What does that mean to you all? Don, what's collaboration? Government, all the various factors working together, obviously. Uh, you've got to have uh, businesses that have a good product, obviously. you got to have somebody that's going to buy that good product and use it. But you may also need to get some startup capital, some funding to help get started, uh, whether it be for a bank or, or other funding, that type of thing would be what I would think you're talking about. Um, but it's, but at the same token, uh, your ideas have to be such that when you when you do this, it, it makes sense. It can't just be a, a shot in the dark, necessarily. I'm not saying don't innovate. I'm not saying don't take a chance. I'm just saying whenever you you uh, start something, you're asking for some assistance. You got you got something to prove. those resources that are out there because we have a wealth of them in this region and then working together with all the different uh, parties to to reach a common goal and that benefits your individual business as well as the region as a whole so I don't think that we have to think about it as competition and a good example being from Bluefield is the two Bluefields it drives me up the wall it's like two 13 year olds arguing back and forth over who has the new pair of Jordans. I don't know. It's And so you see that Bluefield, West Virginia wants to grow, and Bluefield, Virginia wants to grow, but for the life of them, they can't work together to do it. Um, and as communities and counties all in Southwest Virginia, we need to make sure that we're not doing that. We need to make sure that we're finding the resources, you know, that there are tons of people in this room that have the expertise and have the knowledge um, you know, as well as, um, of course, the funding that's out there. But I think that we need to not take for granted that power of collaboration because there, there is strength in numbers and um, we're only selling ourselves short if we don't do that. I've seen some bright spots through the speed related to collaboration. Um, for example, I, I believe that there's a collaborative effort uh, between Russell and Buchanan and Tazewell County for a regional industrial uh, authority, right? Uh, we have other regional industrial authorities throughout the region. Um, I, I've seen collaboration through tourism, right? Uh, we've had some fantastic things that have happened through tourism. Uh, and you know, that collaboration, it, it never would have happened the way that it's happened without that collaboration. So we know how to do it. How do we expand it? How do we grow it? So collaboration is an important part of what we need to, to be thinking about, talking about. None of us can do it independently. We all have to depend upon one another. A unified Appalachian uh, community region. Uh, so that's another one of those collaborative thoughts. Um, health, growth, infrastructure, there are things to do. Uh, that was that was brought up as, as something that we need to continue to expand on, right? But do you think that will keep the kids here? You no, know, I was hoping we would have some of our young people here today. There was something wanting to come, uh, but they uh, apparently were not able to. We have one. We have a token member. We have one. All right. <laughs> great. Great. Student at UGA from here in Lebanon. So it's Madison. Thank you for being here. I certainly appreciate that. We had some show up at some of our round tables. And they talked about things to do. You know, that they would like to see more things to do. And then I asked them, if you can work here and make $70,000 a year, if you get out of school, or you can go to Front Oak, Charlotte, Charlottesville, and make $100,000 a year, which one are you going to do? Out of about 10 students, all of them except for one said, I'm going to run out of Charlottesville, Charlotte. I'm going to make $100,000 a year. 
So it's not the things to do that can keep our young people here. It's a combination. It's a combination of having and being able to make a livable wage. Having and being able to, to have the things that young people want to do. But we worked on those things for our tourism. And we're seeing more and more of that. So that's great. We talked about health care. Health care is a big issue in the region right now. I'm not going to get into the ins and outs of that, but we talked a good bit about that. Uh, growth, uh, we talked about thinking locally. Instead of looking at one another as one another's competition, we talked about collaborating. And I'm seeing businesses collaborate. I'm seeing businesses work together in the region. Some of them didn't know one another existed, but now they do, and they're looking at the other. Um, infrastructure, we talked about continuing to grow the technology infrastructure uh, because that's an absolute critical part of that future that's coming. The regional community vision, we want to be a place where people want to live. We want to have entertainment centers. We want to have a public service network that's no longer siloed but collaborative. You know, I know the educational system struggles, right? Because it's expensive. It's expensive to maintain and take care of schools and you've got all the stuff that you have to do. You know, are there ways that we can break out of those silos and collaborate with services? Work together across county lines, across state lines. Wow, that would be cool, right? Can we do that? If we can't, why not? You know, there was a man who told me some time back. Uh, he told me, you know, why not us, why not them, right? He said, we can do anything we want to do, we'll just set our minds to it. Why not us, why not them? And that's what we need to be thinking about. Why not us, why not them? Why can't we be that change, that bright spot across the U.S. that's totally different than what we were before? So we're going to move on into the value proposition, or the competitive advantage. And I'm going to start out by asking the panelists if you could tell us what you feel like the competitive advantage is for our region and for your business in our region. And I know we talked a little bit about the vision. It may be a little bit duplicative, but that's okay. It's what we do what we believe, right? So let's start on this end, Tom. Start first. Talking about uh, our competitive advantage, uh, I can, I'll speak more towards Marshfield. This particular thing is is in, in the lower south part of southwestern Virginia. You know, we've got from on standing machine shops. I know that Mark Brothers has one up in Bluefield, but that's at the other end. But you know, we can work together for all the big projects for certain. But you know, we've got that competitive advantage. But again, the fact that you diversified uh, with you know. Coatings like Linex, machine shop, welding, fabrication, all types of metal. That gives them a, a, hand, you know, a leg up in the area as far as uh, a competitive advantage. As far as looking out globally for that competitive advantage, again, we're looking at government contracts to be able, because of the fact that we have a, uh, the ability to make things here that we can ship to other places. And, uh, and it, and it goes against what Sam's talking about, but because we do, unfortunately, have a little bit more weight trade in this area, then we're certainly way more competitive in that regard. Uh, but we also make a superior product as well. So we should be able to ask them. And, and honestly, that's what I've been pushing for. So trying to get that where we can get a little bit more out of, out of the product that we make, because we should, because it's a quality product. And I think that's the. The work ethic of those that we have working is another advantage uh, that we have in this area that we can push forward and, and make ourselves known outside of the church as far as being able to get uh, statewide recognition and or, or just southeast United States uh, recognition for our products. I think probably the, the best competitive advantage that we have is the people. Uh, We've got a work ethic that, that is not common in the United States anymore. We've done all over the country and, and, and foreign countries, and we uh, uh, there's just not a work ethic, work ethic where we really care. 
Uh, one thing we try to do is create a, a family-like environment where we're all working for the same thing, so being collaborative, which just simply means co-laboring together for the same thing. And so we're, we believe that, uh, uh, that we got that here. One of the reasons we're here is, uh, and one of the main reasons is the people and the work ethic is there. That makes us competitive. We happen to be in a business where there is no competition. So we don't, at least for this long time, we have no competition to come. You know, but right now we've got to manage that. But, but uh, we uh, we know that uh, the behind it all has got to be the stability of, uh, of a workforce that is more than just a workforce. It's more than just a job. It can't just be punching time clocks and all those kind of things, at least in our estimation. We think that we've got to care for one another, we've got to be involved in one another's lives, and, 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 and just bring stability to the whole situation. And when we need to work together to uh, attain a, a goal that may seem impossible, it gives you a leg up on being able to do that. We've been able to do things that, that uh, the experts told us we would never do. We, the products that we made, which are now about 30 products, um, uh, virtually all of them uh, we were told we would never be able to do. We've done that uh, from our people working together on a common goal that was impossible. Uh, we like the word impossible because that kind of eliminates competition right there. You know, when they think it's impossible, they don't do it. We know that all things are possible if you go about it in the right way. And so, so we think that uh, you know, the competitive edge that we have is is here certainly the, I don't even think about the cost part of it. Uh, my goal here, our goal is not to pay a, a lesser wage. We don't want to pay uh, bottom wages. It's just not, it's not our style. And so, um, so we think that, uh, we think that the people, uh, that's, that's our age and why we're here. I would have to echo the, the same thing and that is our people. Uh, I feel like that is our competitive edge. And, and two, we brought that with the spirit of working with hope. And that is, um, I had a machinist, you two appreciate this, we don't do a lot of machining anymore. I had a machinist that there was a time that every time I went to see him with a new project, this was one of the very first things that he would say is, we can't do that, we can't do that. At the time, that was about 20 years ago, and it's when Bob the Builder was a big, big thing. <laughs> I actually went to the store and bought a little Bob the Builder doll, and I set it on his machine, and I said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> and that, that seemed to set the tone for what we were doing at the time, and, and, and uh, the doll's still there. And we are, uh, are still working and diversifying with them. And I feel like that is our competitive edge, is certainly our people and our abilities to solve problems uh, and innovate within our own product. So that's, that's kind of our competitive edge. I, I do think that our, our work ethic is what helps us stand out um, in this region. I also think that some things, and I saw it up on one of the slides, but Sam did, Sam did touch on it, is, and I don't know, I may hurt some people's feelings saying this, but uh, you, the ability and opportunity to utilize ex-offenders as employees, um, you know, we're a prime example of that, and of course, I have certain offenses that I will not <laughs> employ, but I, I, people deserve a second chance, and I think that we are for, a forgiving people in this region. Um, I think we're more open-minded than what people give us credit for. We could sure use a little bit of improvement on that as well when it comes to, to generational differences and um, the way the world is evolving, and we have to evolve with that, or um, we will be left behind, continue to be left behind. Um, but when you hire, when you give someone an opportunity, you give someone a second chance that's coming out of jail, they, I, I probably have 20 guys out of my 55, and three of them are leaders. They haven't missed a day of work. Raise your hand if you can say that about somebody. No hands, because we all know that that's, that's one of the, 
Um, the hardest thing is to get people to show up for work every day um, if they pass the drug test in the first place. So, but I think that those, that's, that's part of our competitive advantage. I think another part is that as a region as a whole, it is a beautiful place to live. We have a low cost of living, um, but that's not an excuse to underpay our people. I know at Lawrence Brothers, we, um, we probably don't pay enough, but we pay more than what the average manufacturer pays in our area. Um, I think we also have a variety of products across our region that we make that people don't even know. I didn't know that Northfield does a Linex coating. That's, that's fantastic. Um, we at Lawrence Brothers have three or four different coatings that we apply that maybe two or three people all across the United States apply. So uh, we have a niche market in that, and we have people that come to us um, because they know that we're a one-stop shop. And there are lots of manufacturers like that in our region where they can do the rework on certain things, they can do the metalwork, the coating. Um, you know, for example, where we are, we bring the steel in, in in raw form and we burn it out on one of our two lasers um, on our, or on our plasma table and then we can uh, tack it, weld it up, clean it, sandblast it, and coat it all the way through the process. And then when it's out there in the field and it's you know, been damaged and beat up three or four years later, they can bring it back to us and we'll make it look like new and do all of that again. So that can't be said of um, a lot of manufacturers outside of this area. People tend to focus on one thing. I think that we as a people try to um, become very good at what we do and we, we are pig-headed sometimes, but we're also, uh, we have that fight in us here in this, in this area and I think that, that that sets us apart as well. I have to agree with every of the other panelists. We all have faced challenges within the coal industry. And I think that we all continue as businesses to work through those challenges. And we were used to the time frames and the logistical issues that were developed with, with the coal industry. And we survived those and we made those work for us. And we can still, still make those do in a diversified market. So I think that we, we do have that work ethic and, and that educational background that, that we can make uh, grow and to continue our, our work. Thank you all. So we had a number of, of things that were part of our uh, competitive advantage of the business roundtables. Uh, we talked about being friendly and inviting community. Uh, we talked about um, being a safe, low-crime region, uh, low-stress region, rich in history and culture, uh, with an innovative mindset, um, extremely good work ethic, uh, as everyone has already mentioned. Um, no rat race. How long does it take you to travel 30 miles here? And if you had to travel 30 miles going into D.C. <laughs> at rush hour, how long would it take? <laughs> Two hours. That's exactly right. It, it is a long, drawn out. Uh, process uh, trying to get around some of the cities. So we have that as, as a, a significant advantage. The resourcefulness of our people, and I can say, you know, from visiting all the businesses that I've visited over the past couple of years, um, man, it's amazing. It's amazing what we can do. Absolutely amazing. Uh, I've seen businesses that have come up with ideas that scientists in, in their laboratories wouldn't come up with. Uh, and, you know, as uh, Dr. Hooper was saying, it, they may not have that educational attainment, but they, they know how to solve problems. We have technical skills, and we're a can-do people. Uh, we have a creativity that's, that's pretty unique here. Uh, when you think about all the different types of art and music that's here, um, it, it's interesting how that actually ties to the ability to solve problems. Uh, music, art, creativity, and solving problems actually are very, very closely related. Uh, so it, it's very interesting that we have so much of that here as part of our culture, and we also see that manifest itself out, out in the business world. Um, we have a lot of diverse uh, training opportunities, outdoor activities, um, lots and lots of those now. Um, certainly has, has grown dramatically over the past uh, five years or so. Uh, absolutely amazing. 
Um, we're also centrally located to within a day's drive of 48%, roughly half the U.S. population, right? So we're really centrally located to a lot of, of the rest of, of the U.S. We have four seasons. How many of you love four seasons weather as much as I do? I mean, I absolutely love Not being able to go through the four seasons. <laughs> Uh, by the time summer's done, I'm ready for fall. Uh, by the time fall's done, I'm ready to start seeing some snow. By the time the snow's done, I'm ready to, to start seeing things grow again in the springtime, right? So, uh, so how do we get there? And I put this slide up there. I know you can't read it. It's not going to be in your, in your, uh, in your handout exactly like that. But I wanted to demonstrate, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of ideas on things that we can do as a region, things we can do as communities to help us get there. And these aren't my ideas, these are the ideas that the communities have brought to the table. So we're going to move on into some of the bold steps, right? So how do we get there? There was basically eight that appeared over and over, right? Uh, they came up at multiple, multiple business roundtables. So those eight were a region-wide marketing effort, um, establish a regional planning board composed of all stakeholders. And that was region-wide from Tazewell County to Lee County. Utilize older gener the older generation to mentor or train up up and coming youth. I thought that was really, really good, and I was glad to see it come up several times. I, I thought that's, that's interesting. Provide funding mechanisms to support expansion of existing and new business development in the region. Facilitate, facilitate how to make our next great thing, similar to the Eureka research range approach. Expand UVA-wise economic development forum into a two-day event, including more brainstorming sessions between economic developers, workforce development, developers, and regional businesses. Grow the region's apprenticeships and develop mountaintop solar farms. Those are the ones that showed up on multiple uh, business rounds. So region-wide marketing effort, and they showed up in these forms, right? Create marketing campaigns that clearly defines the strength of a region and the way that it tracks. Promote our region's economic successes, i.e. current business growth through statewide media. Marketing program, eat local, buy local, do local. Marketing the region, develop region-wide marketing efforts to attract workforce businesses, tourists, Etc. Uh, market driven action, wow market marketing video uh, going viral. So developing a marketing video that would go across the region. Use TV, YouTube, podcasts, etc. to market for the region. One question that I had is who's our target our audience? Straight market. Who's our target audience? Targeting the world. <clears throat> what are we targeting them with? Are we saying come bring your business here? Are we saying come live here? There's things that we need to think through. Do we need to market to ourselves? We have 150 roughly people in the room, right? Do we need to figure out a way to spread the message within the region of the change that we would like to see? Does that need to be part of the marketing effort? And can it all be done as one big marketing effort? So those are all things that we need to be thinking about working through as part of that bold step, right? Other bold steps. Establish regional planning board composed of all stakeholders, industry-led. Create Team Southwest Virginia to study and direct regional efforts, community planning, Regional brainstorming sessions. Create an action team of regional and industry leaders for 
are passionate to create a long-term vision and strategic plan and do a roadshow. Establish a planning board composed of all stakeholders led by industry. Develop a regional strategic plan that identifies the companies already here that we can focus on supporting, growing, and expanding. So this was one of the old steps that was put out there. Do we have anything like this that goes on from Tazewell County all the way to Lee County? What, what would that be? What is it? Yeah, you see that. You see it? Right. Right. So we have that. That's economic development purpose, right? So what about the other things that aren't specifically economic development related? Are we planning around those? For example, are we planning around their education? Do we have something that's working across the entirety of that region on the education side of we plan? We have community development groups that cover that entire region through we planning. Do we need to expand? Basically is what I'm asking. Do we need to expand what we're planning around and start thinking further out the vision? Utilize the older generation to mentor and train up, up, up and coming youth. I love this one. Well, this is just fantastic. How do we do it? Let's start. Let's start today, right? Amen. What's the average age of the leadership in most of the companies that we have throughout the region? That's going to be pretty high, right? In fact, we have some that are very, very, very concerned about that because they have leadership that's going to be retiring out and they don't know how they're going to fill those gaps. So this is one way to do that. So develop regional mentoring system to train advocates for economic and workforce streets of Southwest Virginia. Uh, advocate a regional job mentoring program between high schools, colleges, and regional businesses. Uh, and just one of them was just a mentoring program. So I think there's opportunity there. Provides, provide funding mechanisms to support expansion of existing and new business development in the region. And we have a lot of those funding mechanisms in place, right? We have some funding mechanisms there. But they're very specific, right? Is there opportunity for us to actually grow those? Is there opportunity for us to expand some of those? And how could we go about doing that? I'll give basically a, a, an example that was brought out um, in some of the business roundtables that we talked about. What would happen if we said, you know, the labor force isn't here to support big companies coming in. So we're not going to go after those companies anymore. We're going to turn our focus to growing the existing businesses we have. We're going to shift the focus financially, effort, everything in our region, we're going to focus on growing the businesses we have. What would happen? What would happen? And I don't, you know, I can't say for sure, but I'm thinking that if our businesses begin to grow and move, what's going to happen to your supply chain? You say, how are you doing this, right? What better economic development and marketing, marketing opportunity is there than an existing, thriving, growing economic base of the businesses you have? So that was something we talked about. How do we learn to shift that focus? Right now, we don't have excess labor. If a company comes in, they are going to be taking labor from somebody else. No question about it. And are they going to come in and take it for a dollar more an hour? And that company that's been there for 60 years suddenly doesn't have any employees to support itself. Right? So we need to think about that as we're thinking about opportunities to how to get there. How do we get there? Yes, sir. Prosperity draws people. Absolutely. If there's opportunity and our businesses are thriving, then people come. You don't have to worry about an advertising program. You don't have to put the Wall Street Journal or run an ad. It's just they just see.
simply going to come because there's opportunity. And people lack opportunity, and they're always looking for new places to, uh, to, uh, to go that are prosperous. Uh, you can take St. Charles, Virginia, they tell me at one time, had 35,000 people in it. You ever been to St. Charles? Can you imagine such a thing? I mean, that's over half of what Kingsport has. It's hard to imagine, but that was because of the coal business. Also, wise <coughs> property had lots of people in it because of the coal business. It, people will follow prosperity. And uh, so, my thought is that you've got certainly multiple ways to go about it, but the people that you have here, that's what you need to concentrate on. The others will come. I'm telling you, people will come like we did. We came. Uh, of course, we were hassled by, uh, by, <laughs> by Jack Kennedy and, and uh, uh, by Carl Snodgrass, but, but, but they, they drug us in here, but nonetheless, we came and we're glad we did. And I tell you, there's a lot of other people that are they're just waiting on opportunities. And uh, so I think that's the answer to it. And my, I'm a pretty bottom line sort of guy. I'm not much for all the ancillary stuff, but I, you know, bottom line is make it prosperous for people to come, and uh, then you're going to have a whole other set of problems to deal with, but at least they'll be possible. <laughs> Sam, one of my thoughts about that, and I've been thinking that I just happened to be on a regional IDA, and one of its members are here today, and that's David Eaton. Um, and that is Buckhannon County, Russell County, Nassau County. And hearing you talk and talking about collaboration, consolidation, if you will, I think one of the biggest things that we need to answer within our own local governments, within our own uh, businesses, and I guess that first thought is, do we really want to be collaborating? Do we really want to be selfless? Do we want to see one of our neighbors or one of our neighboring uh, businesses prosper and maybe we don't? Do we want to be a part of that for our region that ultimately ends up helping us all? Do we really want to be a region of people who collaborate collaborate and work together. You know, I was thinking here, I wrote down a couple of notes. Along with the IDA board, there's several things that's been that I've been involved with, the Go Virginia Project, Go Global with Coal, and now in the ballet and working in, in that and all the wonderful uh, uh, things that the state of Virginia has done for us. Uh, you know, I, I travel a lot, I, and when I say a lot, I mean a lot, all over the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And this last week, I was in Nevada at a mining conference there in Elko, Nevada, and I was telling people the uh, collaboration I've had with the state of Virginia and how that they have helped us, how they have helped us to move, and they've never heard of anything like that. You know, the state of Virginia, you know, they're, they're sponsoring uh, all these wonderful programs, but what do we do, and what is the answer that we make? Do we want to be involved, and if the state of Virginia is going to help us, how do we streamline all of those programs throughout the state of Virginia, our region, and our own counties, to pull that together to make it a positive reaction instead of something that just leads up to the point, and I call it drowning on the riverbank. After you have already swam from one side to the other, you drowned on the riverbank. Is that what we're going to do? Or do we really want to make that effort? Do I want to see Lawrence Brothers and Norris get a machining uh, contract or not? And I think that's where, that's where we have to go. Do we want to help our neighbors? Do we want to be good neighbors or not? Thank you, Tom. Okay. We'll cruise on through these, and then you know, we kind of started a little early, but we're going to have a panel to comment on. Uh, so that, that actually worked out very well. Thank you. 
Um, expand UVA Watts Economic Development Forum into a two-day economic, uh, two-day event, including more business, brainstorming sessions between economic developers, workforce developer, developers, and regional businesses. Uh, that came up several times um, in a very similar format. Grow regional apprenticeships. And I think there's a program in place to do that. How do we support that? How do we as a region see that playing out with our businesses? How do we see that? How do we connect and make sure our businesses are connected to the opportunities that are, that are there? And then how do we create new opportunities to uh, help them do the road? Develop mountaintop solar farms. And this actually came in a couple of different forms. It also was discussed Bridge lines, using, utilizing bridge lines to support the technology uh, development. And one of the specific things that was talked about was the fact that the uh, satellite arrays can be going into lower orbit. Uh, it's actually already started. So as that continues to progress, it becomes a reality to provide uh, broadband services. You know, where are going to be the touch points, the terrestrial, terrestrial touch points? And they talked about utilizing potentially mountaintops to do some of that. Because it will allow you to keep a longer vision of the sky and actually be a, a more valuable connection point. Uh, and then they talked about uh, utilizing it for Wi-Fi development as well as solar farms. And then this was all of the bold steps that, as I mentioned before, you'll all get all of this in a report. Uh, you get it. Uh, it will be several pages, but we'll send it in a PDF. This was all of the bold steps that were more locally focused. Okay? These are the things that didn't duplicate from region to region uh, or area to area. And they, you know, kind of a lot of them had a lot of, of local focus. So uh, um, those you'll receive as well. So now, for those who haven't talked about the bold steps, that are part of the town. Um, can you give us your thoughts related to that? Tom? Okay, so bold steps. What do we need to You know, I, mean, I started dating sure back around about 2001, 2002, and the first thing I did was join the Chamber of Commerce, local Quantas Club, because I'm not from these here parts. I grew up in Atlanta. So I considered the, the outside. Okay. And uh, that's okay. Um, I, I haven't run, yet run me out yet, so I think it's going to be start. But we, we had these similar meetings. And, you know, go to the chamber, we, we had similar ideas like this 20 years ago. What do we do? How do we get this done? I go to Washington, spend about four years, kind of drift away from the local meetings here, come back, one meeting, same thing. Like watching a soap opera. We got to change that mindset. We got to get past the planning. We got plans. We got manufacturing plans. We got IT plans. We got health plans. We got plans. We got some vision. We just got to get people now. We got to get. We got to channel this energy. We got the work in. I think we got the know-how. I know we got the know-how. There's no question. On that. We just got to figure out how do we collaborate with each other. And to your point about. You know, do we want to see each other succeed? And absolutely, because when one boat goes up, everybody. But when the tide rises, we all get it. That's a good thing. So, but you know, when you're trying to, to consolidate things, I don't got to say that. You mentioned consolidation, everybody just goes into a trance. But we need to do some of those things. You know, we try to consolidate schools in Wise County. Good Lord, you would have thought that was the end of the earth. You know, we passed up a fifty-five million dollar opportunity over ten years because we didn't consolidate properly. Fifty-five million dollars over a ten-year period because we couldn't figure out how to get past Friday night football. I know that's going to upset a few people, but I can't help. This is just something that just had to be stuck in my crop. Please, we have a nine-one-one center in the city of North. The city of North is surrounded by the, by Wise County. Guess what? It has its own nine-one-one center. Why? Why does the Little Wisco have a time on one second? That's the kind of stuff that pulls counties together. You had St. Paul High School two miles, three miles down the road, you had Castlewood High School. Why? Because of an artificial line that's on a map that we couldn't get past. 
we've got to get past these types of things in order to move our area forward. Absolutely. There's just no way around it. We've got to do that. Um, okay, I'm really going to run over here. Let it rip. Let it rip. Leadership. Leadership. we got some good, solid leadership. But I'm going to suggest we're top heavy leadership. Wise County, I'm familiar with Wise County, Scott County, so I live in Scott County now. Wise County's got 84 supervisors, 38,000 people. Wow. I almost got my first one, you know, everybody's got their own personal supervisor. Right? This is silly. <laughs> the minimum required, I found out during the school consolidation, was three. That's all we need. Three, at large, not representing my group against your group. Because that's what it turns out to be if you're not at large. You've got my group against your group. That's got to stop. That has to change. If you have three at large, you pay them a salary, say, this is your job. If you don't do real well, the administrators don't tell on you, you're not going to get voted back in. That's how you've got to change. you got to get that. we got to start with that side. And there's a whole plethora of other things we need to do in, in, in that regard. But we've got to get, we got to break these barriers down county to county. And yeah, it takes a long time to drive from Cumberland Gap to to tap and look at that's, that's a three and a half hour journey at best if you do it properly. And some of us it can talk about that. But, anyway. um, but you, we, we've, got a, we've got a good reason here. We just got to start thinking, tear down these walls, think out of the box, and, and utilize the people we got here. As, as everybody up here has, has said, and I think everybody in this room agrees, we've got, we've got a great group of people with tremendous work ethic. But that work ethic, if we've got to pull it together somehow or another. So that, and, and I think that was touched on in, in these bold steps, is how we have a planning committee, and gosh, you we go with committees again. How many more committees do we need? How many more groups do we need to form? But we've got to figure out a way to get these groups together so that we can utilize all of our assets in this area. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I think that it, it goes back to collaboration and finding out and asking those hard questions of whether we do really want to collaborate. Um, and honestly, if you want to be progressive and you want to move forward, then the answer has to be yes. If you don't want to collaborate, then maybe you should move to Northern Virginia. Um, uh, we, we don't want to be like Northern Virginia. We want to be like Southwestern Virginia, just better than what we are now. Or, or more prosperous than what we are now. I think what stood out to me on in the bold steps is utilizing the older generation to mentor and train up and train upcoming youth. And I think that that is very important, but I think that's also inside the box that we've always been thinking. We need to flip that. And we need to have the younger generation mentoring the older generation as well. Um, I read something the other day that if you are I think it said if you're in your 40s, but I'm not quite there yet. So I think if you're in your mid, anywhere from 35 to 55 or 60, and you're still in the workforce, which most of us are, and you don't have a 20-something mentoring you, you will be left behind in the technological age. So of course, they can learn from us. They can learn the work ethic. They can learn that what a salary job means, and that's not working 35 hours a week. They can learn that you have to give it your all, and you have to be there, and you have to be there every single day. And you don't have a mental health day every single week. And you can't ask for um, a pay raise and hours cut after you've been with the company for six weeks. It doesn't work like that. Can you tell I've seen those things? So you have to, we have to, but we have to have them mentoring us on the things that they know that we're not all as savvy on. We have our children do it, so why shouldn't we have the upcoming youth do it? And then you can turn that into really an intergenerational mentoring program. And I've seen these work up in Northern Virginia and in different places. And what do they do in order to become a functioning program? They look at a program like Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and they model it after that. They model it after a program that is that has, you know, a solid example, a solid history and foundation. And so that goes into we need to do that as a region. Let's find a region that can mentor us. Let's find a company that can mentor us. Let's find individuals like Nelson here from MTC and Sam. They've been mentoring us at Lawrence Brothers, and I think that they would attest to the fact that in the, I don't know, 
four months, five months we've worked together, we've grown leaps and bounds because we've been able to identify these bold steps, but not just identify them, actually put them into place and start doing the things. You can't just say, it is, it is like a Spanish soap opera even. It's a soap opera that you can go back three years later and you haven't even lost the plot line. We can't do that. And, and I do believe in the importance of the Chamber of Commerce and being involved in those committees, but only if you're willing to help push them outside of their comfort zone and help push them to take the action. Because you, we can plan all we want, but if we don't actually put it into action, then it's, it's dead in the water. Um, and we won't come out of the, the hole that we're trying to climb out of. Um, so for me, that, that was the bold step that kind of stuck out, was that we need to kind of flip that one on its head and develop an intergenerational mentoring program. And I think we have all the resources to be able to do that. It's just pulling together the right people in a room. I do think that, that maybe we need some kind of uh, board composed of all the stakeholders, but it's just about getting the right people in the right room at the same time and making it um, interesting enough and um, giving them incentives to not leave an hour in or two hours in. You can't leave before you're putting the steps into action or making the, the plans to do that. Robin? I think the whole step that stood out to me was the technology. With the technology we have today, all of us work together. You were talking about, no, I'm sorry, about three hours to drive. We don't have to do that anymore. You know, I, I work with people in, in other states and other, in other places. I've never even met them. And we, we need to you know, I'm constantly look at it. I, I review structures and somebody goes and, and takes a video while or I'm or live streaming so that I can look at it right there, right then. So I have real time data instantly. So we need to utilize that more and, and, and learn how to use all the all this availability. My my grandson, you know, uses YouTube, he's eight years old and he's learning how to create videos and, and, and put himself out there. So we all need to do that so that we can we can work all over this county or all over our region and then and then once we grow our region we can work globally and, and that's that's gonna happen a lot quicker than we want. Thank you. Now for the audience. Does anyone in the audience have thoughts around these old steps? Are there bold steps that have been mentioned here that we need to make sure we consider? I'd like to speak on one thing. Okay. Our regional IDA is uh, sorry. Our regional IDA has taken an aggressive approach to create an idea concept. Uh, I thought of this back a while called industry education. And we all have access, or most of us have access to broadband, and that's the business I'm in. But uh, we had talked about it being taught, and that's uh, as far as our industry being able to teach the teacher and the kids uh, on the industry standard that they need for our next workforce and our next generation. So we want to make sure that we're partnering on the industry education. You know, if the kids knew what was there, and they, that would just, you know, sweep the pot a little bit. So it would in, entice them to want to take a, a lead ball. Another, another thing that Russell County did was a race program, which we're educating kids here at Southwest Community, Community College and we're paying for the first two years of education, but it's not really free. We're having to have 2.0 UK and 100 hours of community service back in the community. We're hoping these 100 hours of community service will go back into the industries and let them you know, fill it out and get a taste of it. Todd's a great partner. I'm uh, glad to see you sitting on this panel because I listen to him a lot on the industry side too of, uh, of what he sees throughout the country and throughout the states that we do. So it's a good relationship. We're partnering, looking at revenue sharing and working together. But I, I think our education system to break those cycles, get our kids into that next role. It's very critical in these next few years. Thank you. Anyone else? Sam, so why can't we do a marketing effort for young people? You know, why can't we go out and find these young people and bring them to our area and match them up with the industry, as Melanie said, match them up with the industry that will give them the livelihood that they're looking for to raise their families. Yeah, I don't think we spend a lot of time on everything else talking about all these young people that leave our area, but we're not doing anything to address that. You know, why can't we match them up? 
I'm I sorry. I, can I help you answer that? Yes, sir. I don't sir. think it is that we can't. Ma'am, I think we don't. Okay. I think that's the answer. I think we can. Is, is that something that needs to be added to or be a part of that marketing, regionwide marketing plan that was, that was talked about? Oh, most definitely. See, th yeah. those, are, those are the things that we need to be thinking about as we look at these bold steps and we're getting ready to move into a plan time, right? And you're all going to get a chance to participate in that. Um, we really need to think about big picture, long term. How do these bold steps, how do they reflect what we can do long term? And then how do we get there? Who needs to be doing it? Who needs to be involved? So, Anything else from the audience related to, to the bold steps? Can I speak on that marketing real quick? Go ahead. I think with the market, we do have to market it. I don't know that we have to pour millions of dollars into a marketing plan, but I think there's too many young people. And even myself, I've been, I'm from this area, I've been back in this area for 13 years, and I didn't even know the CEO was here until a year ago. I didn't know that these type of things existed until a year ago. That's that's unacceptable. It really is. And we don't we are do you think that the kids that are in high school that are training to be welders or machinists or mechanics or engineers know that these type of industries are around here and are at home and that they can actually stay home and raise a family here where there's a low crime and where they have child care because their parents are here? and still make a, a great living wage, they don't know that. So we do have to get that out there and let people know. Well, isn't that a failure of communication from our economic development offices? You know, I could say it is from Tassel County. <laughs> Anybody else have comment from the office? I guess ethical dilemma of, well, I can't turn my back on coal, 
because my grandfather built it on that and Cole's been so good to us. But I want to move that legacy forward and I want to make it even greater and I want to grow it globally. So in order to do that, I have admitted that Cole's never going to come back, if not to where it was, and that it is going to be a portion or a percentage of what our industry, um, you know, the work that we're doing, but it, it can't be really more than a quarter. I mean, if you want to really grow and prosper and diversify, um, I think that we have accepted for too long the, the DS4 that you're talking about, that it's, it's okay if you can live in Southwest Virginia and make 30,000, 35,000, 40,000, is it? It's really not okay. Why is that okay? Why should we make below the average of the entire state? So if we have accepted that, we need to flip that on its head and stop accepting it and step out and say, no, we are worth more than that. We are worth, our, our intelligence is there, our education is there, and certainly our capabilities and our work ethic are there. So we should actually make more than the people in Northern Virginia because we work 45, 50, 60 hours a week and not 35. My thoughts on that, of course, is the same, and that and, and that is that that we have we we are now educated. We have now got the economic shock that is now proving us that coal can go away, and we can live through that. We we somehow, by the grace of God, we skimmed over that hump uh, in, in my business as well. But one of the things and. I, have, I, I do not have a vendetta in no way against teachers in education because I'm for teachers in education, 100% for them. But we, the people, we, the business owners, we, the taxpayers, have to stop hiring employees that are teachers for us that teach our children that they need to get an education because then they can go somewhere else and get a good job. Those are the people that work for us and we need to stop that. We need to stop that. We need to pay them more than $30,000 a year. I agree. We're educating our kids, they need to make more But why should, we pay, why should we pay teachers more than $30,000 a year when we're in our local policemen minimum wage? These are the people that protect us. We pay them minimum wage. Are they not, are they not more important than that? My son is a Virginia State Trooper. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's, it's true. But we have to keep training, or quit training our children that the best that they can do is to go somewhere else. And then after they get there, they raise a family. And Grandma and Grandpa goes with them. Been that mentality, I think, uh, for a long, long time. When the coal business gets bad, everybody goes north or somewhere else to get a job. And when it gets good, they come flying back. Um, and I think for all of us in the coal business, uh, I can just speak for me. Um, I was shocked that the coal business was not coming back this time. I knew it wasn't, but it's hard to get over that, you know, when your whole economic life has been based around that. And I think that's been, I think that's been a tough thing. And I think it's interesting. You said we just kind of skimmed over it because I think you're right. Somehow we realize now maybe that we can make it without the COVID. And I think it was hard, a hard lesson for a lot of us. Although probably the vestiges of that still hold on, I think, in some. But, but we, uh, uh, you know, I think that the, the biggest thing that, that I've heard here today, and I'm not, certainly throwing off them 34 meetings that you all have had, I think that's all wonderful. I would be crazy as a bad guy to lock me up by doing 34 meetings. Uh, I, I'm like, uh, I'm like, let's meet for two hours decide what we're going to do, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and I'll be my part, and then let's come back and get to what we accomplished. So I think there's a, uh, and I might be a little ADD for something, nonetheless, uh, uh, I am, uh, I'm a firm believer in a meeting. I'm a firm believer in coming to a resolve. I'm also a firm believer in getting it done and assigning tasks. So when you leave a meeting, you know everybody says, boy, that, gee, that was great. And then you come back together and you have another meeting, gee, that was great. But do you leave the meeting saying, gee, that was great. Now, so-and-so's doing this and so-and-so's doing that. 
and we're accomplishing what we met about. And so I think that, and, and certainly Sam and others have just done a tremendous job in uh, all, the, uh, all the points that they brought out here. And I think that the information is uh, m way more than enough to coagulate that into a, a plan of action that, uh, just like the mayor said, I think it's time to act. I mean, let's do it. I, I don't know what it is, but I think we need to do it. I'd rather, I'd rather be found doing it than have it be wrong than I'd be found doing nothing. Uh, you know, I just, I think we just need to do it. You know, let's get some, get some people with, that have got some accomplishment uh, ability in them and let's, let's, uh, let's accomplish things. Let's uh, take these wonderful points we've learned and let's go after with everything we've got and we'll do that and we'll really help one another. I know that's hard to do. One of the greatest concepts that I've learned in life is that by helping others, I really help myself. Boy, it's hard to believe, you know. There's a book. Sure. There's a book. There's a book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I can just tell you that, it's, that it really takes, if, if we are really about, we got this policy. We, bought, we started off, when we started these businesses, I bought a bunch of stuff from China. It was cheap. Boy, we bought things that were uh, like a tenth of the price, big equipment, I mean millions and all. And we thought it was cheap. Do <laughs> we got it here? And then found out it wasn't cheap. Would have been better to have it made here and have it, and have it uh, made right the first time. But nonetheless, we, we believe that our companies believe in doing business locally as much as it's practical. We, we want to always do business locally. We don't haggle price. If I come to your business, you'll never hear me haggle price. I'll, in fact, uh, uh, Don told you that uh, when we started doing business with Norris, I, I thought they were priced too low in there, and I said, I don't think you make any money doing that. Mm -hmm. If you don't make money, you can't be there for us. So we want you to make money, so let's make sure you're making enough. I know that sounds nuts now, but that's taken from our bottom line, but it's not really because it already comes back. And so, and I'm not using this as an icon, certainly we've got things we can criticize about, but I'm just saying that, that that is our attitude about life. This comes, I'm 71 years old, so I've developed a little bit of that. Used to, I wasn't exactly that way, but I can tell you that, that I found that, that if, you'll, if you'll help to improve other people's lives, most of them will honor you by helping to improve yours. Some will not, those will disappoint you, but you just go on with life about that. So, that's my little piece Okay, we have uh, got three more questions. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Barbara Althauser, and I have a question and a suggestion. Uh, uh, my first comment will be about education. I work with the teachers throughout the state of Virginia, and the comment always is that our counties are the lowest paid. And it's a little embarrassing. Someone talked about things that the teachers say, and I guess what they're telling their students is they have to have part-time jobs to be a teacher and live here. Or you, they're a, and if the husband and the wife both are teachers, they have to coach or do other things to survive. So we need to think about bringing their cost of living up. And the gentleman talked about the state policeman. I think teachers and state police or policemen are two of the most important things that we have. I can't imagine living in a region without either one of those. But my suggestion is, and maybe we have it and I haven't heard it, but these shadowing programs where uh, students in high school, maybe sophomore, uh, would go into a business and we're running in, since I worked for the mining industry, I know about requirements and ages. But that young people that have a particular gift in the technology field or in the welding or the electronics, that they be placed with the manufacturing and shadow people that actually do that to see if they're interested in it. My industry needs welders and certified electricians, and you can't find them. And I'm sure there are other industries in the region that need them also. 
I've mentioned to some high school students, what do you think about being an electrician? They don't know what that is. So how do they know that they don't want to be that? If you had programs with a partnership with the educational community, with the school system, and with the industries, and then you match them up, it certainly would be interesting. The other thing, why not look at, I saw run for office, so invite the young people to shout up the mayor or a councilman or uh, a supervisor, maybe, and more than a day, maybe two or three times a month. One day, I've done this, and you sort of put up with them, and you show them the best of it. What you really should do is show up all the day-to-day -day activities, and when things can go wrong, what you have to do to pull it back together. That would help young people, if because there are a lot of things here that, yes, they might be interested in staying for, but they don't know about it. And the counselors and guidance counselors, and I'm going to say this about them, they don't know all the things that's in the county, so they can't influence them to stay here. They get more materials from other areas about opportunities. So what we need to do as a group is, and we've talked this for years, because I, were, I started out working for Chamber of Commerce. Now, Chambers of Commerce can do so much, and they are important because if you're an outsider looking to come in, you contact the Chamber of Commerce. But the people in the community, the businesses, the elected officials, and I'm going to include the uh, schools in this, everybody, it needs to be a partnership. At one time, the community colleges worked with our school systems, and I was very involved in that. I assume they still do that. I know that the age requirements are a problem, because if you brought a 15 or a 16 year old in and they get hurt and you've got real issues. But somehow or other you need to find a way around that, give children a chance to see what's here and what they'd like to do before they go somewhere else and do it. Thank you. Two more questions. I think one right here and one right here. That one first. Comments? I had one comment. You have the individual actions to run for public office. Okay? In Wise County, this election, only one race has some opposition. That's the sheriff. He retired. And we've got three people running for that position. The other positions are not. Nobody's running against them. Now, we've got leaders in this room. Why do not more people run for public office? If you want changes, then, you know, and I had. That's how I got into office. You know, I've always taught governmental county, encouraged my students to run for office. And I thought, when they contacted me, I thought, well, you know, I, I've been a hypocrite. I'm not running for office, and everybody is, you know, and I tell everybody to go participate in government, and I'm not participating. So I spent 12 years as board of supervisors. And we see committees. We go to appoint committees, and it's hard to find people willing to serve on our committees. People have to step up and get involved in their local government. And I think we need to have term limits. I'm not running this time. You know, I think 12 years, I think we need to change, you know, in, the, in offices. So I think you need to push for term limits for your board of supervisors. They don't need to be in that position for 30 years. And they need to change. And you need to step up and you need to run for office. And think about that when that, but if you think about an election where only one office has opposition. Sad, isn't it? Interesting, that comment actually came from the Wise County Business Channel table. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not stepping up. And you wouldn't believe how hard it is to get people to serve on committees. I understand. Sometimes we don't have to even wait a month because we're still looking for someone that will say yes. They think of all the reasons, you know. I don't want to get involved in politics, it'll hurt my business. Wow. You know, you know, somebody that's opposite party may not like me if I'm in for office. That's the biggest common one I hear from asking people is they don't want to you know, it might affect their business.
kind of mirror what I'm hearing. I think that we, the question is how do we solve the problem? We keep talking about the problem. I see it as a three leg or a tri uh, triad. I see it industry here, education, and the workers, and the workforce. Each of those areas need a financial, economical improvement. Schools need students. Industry needs workers. Workers need jobs with money, with fun funding. But we're not pulling them together. How do we bring these things together? Well, I'm, as, as a former coal miner, I many years in the coal field, as a former engineer, most recently, I see all those things. We have to quit talking about it. Talk is cheap. We got to put some money for it. We got to do something about it. We can talk about these things 34 committees, fine. We can talk about it over and over and over. If we don't act, it doesn't get done. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who has contributed. Um, for those who have participated in the round tables, um, first of all, I'll let Dr. Hooper know that not everybody went to all 34. <laughs> so that was a summer league. It wasn't a process to to the mass, but probably four was the most we had in Warren County. Oh, if right. people coming on. Because I just imagine 34 days. Um, so just a couple of instructions. So those of you who have contributed, thank you so much. And for those who have not been to a round table, um, as you get up to go get your lunch, I'm going to give you some instructions so that we can try to manage this like um, organized and heard of cattle maybe. I don't know. We're going, to, we're going to see what we can work out here. But on each end of the room, we have flip charts up there. And on each side of the room, it says vision, competitive advantage, and bold stats. So after reviewing the documents on your table and hearing some review also from our panel, if there's something you want to add, this is your opportunity. There's markers there, so add it. And we'll collect that and add it to the documentation that we're going to send out to everyone. Some people don't want to speak out, um, and so this gives an opportunity also to collect those ideas. All right, so, and then when we come back from lunch, we're going to do a little work around the bold steps about what to do, we're going to get a game plan. Okay, okay. I'm going to be handing out each one of the bold steps that we covered, um, one to each table. And what I'd like you to do is uh, work together at the table to kind of form a game plan. Uh, if you look at the slide here, and, and each of you at the, on the back of your um, PowerPoint that, I, that everybody had, it's, there's a game plan sitting there as well. But you'll see across the left side, team resources, okay? For whatever the project is that your table gets, Think about who may need to be involved. If you don't know, raise your hand, I'll come, and I'll see if I can get somebody to your table that may be able to help you with who may need to be involved in that. Who should sponsor? Who should be the leader of it? Who, are the, who do the members need to be uh, of that particular uh, group that's going to take this, that particular project forward? Think about the stages of the task. What's got to be done? How do you break it down into the smaller pieces. Uh, what has to happen first, what has to happen second, third, and fourth, and so on. What's the primary objective? What does it mean uh, if this is, if you actually implement it? What's going to happen? What are some of the success factors? And how do they work within the particular project, right? What are some of the success factors uh, that will show that the project's been successful? And then what are some of the challenges that you see um, may be a real part of being an obstacle or a litter to actually implementing the game plan? Uh, I know this is kind of an unusual way to do it. Uh, many of you will probably get something that you've never seen before. But I like the opportunity for people to think about things they've never thought of before because they don't already have barriers in their mind as to how they should be, right? So. I'm going to come around, I'm going to give each table uh, one of the uh, bold steps. And if you could, as you're going through the next about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, go through, work through the game plan with folks there at your table, and then we'll come around and collect them uh, in about 15 minutes. We talked about federal funding and we 
talked about reimbursement for projects done, and you know, the most important thing you need is a good investigator, a good grant writer, and you want to try and find the money in your first and foremost. And then this last owner was telling us about his business, and they're doing a huge expansion, and they have spent a lot of money. And then through different departments, training, equipment, this and that, they're trying to get individual reimbursements back in those little areas, which I thought was a super cool idea. And one of the she consider. And that's all we can. Thank you. So our group talked about some of the logistics. Um, so we personally, at the business that I work with, we've done apprenticeships before. And one of our biggest challenges is working with the school system and the superintendent. Uh, they don't want to let the kids out before for lunch for some funding reasons. And um, we also you know, had to work with the kids' schedules. So our, our ideal is to uh, you know, get the school on board, get the superintendent on board, and work with uh, these businesses that want to do apprenticeships and then have employee buy-in and business buy-in. Because a lot of times it costs them to, to do these apprenticeships. So we need to figure out a way to, to make it appealing to the employees who want to interact with these apprentices and teach them their um, and then lastly, we wanted to celebrate what they were doing and make sure it was publicly uh, known in the media, newspaper, social media, so that people can see that there's a, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end where that they achieve something and the community is actually interacting. Thank you.
bringing in the trade schools and high schools for training uh, and colleges uh, as part of the workforce. Um, the renewable energy industry uh, is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. Uh, so having the education piece develop those, uh, those skill sets will be important to support any industry that shows up here. Um, and then uh, again, we talked about regulations uh, needing to uh, adopt um, or get rid of some regulations uh, to allow these kinds of partnerships to grow. I think that's one of the biggest roadblocks you have because uh, as I'm learning here sitting next to Jeff, uh, coal mines are just dictated by regulation. And, and when a coal mine closes, there's a 10-year program for them to get back their bonds. And they're not going to do anything with that property as long as there's a risk that they might lose their bond. So until that uh, changes, that gives them some leeway to look at alternative solutions that might be able to turn that cost center into a profit center, uh, they can't even look at doing this uh, as long as they may risk losing their bond by doing something outside the guidelines that they've been given. So I think we have to look at what restrictions the government has put on them that, that we can allow them to look at these alternatives. So, okay, our uh, issue was establishing a regional planning board. Uh, we thought that, first of all, the success factors to that uh, should be that we need a very diverse group, a very holistic approach, uh, intergenerational, all-volunteer group, uh, with as much as possible a neutral outlook so that they can think outside the box. Uh, it should be made up of elected officials, chambers of commerce, economic development entities, healthcare, education, business, law enforcement, faith-based community, uh, general citizenship, and civic organizations. First stage is probably to market and advertise the reasons for the board, uh, recruit members, create a strategic plan, smart goals, action plan, a purpose, objectives, and there has to be accountability. This can't just be uh, getting together and talking. And then of course the last stage is the action stage, which should include celebrating successes. That's it. Okay, um, we had uh, utilizing the older generation to mentor and train upcoming youth. Um, I, I think one of the things that sort of echoes what some others have said um, is that you need to involve the school system, but we also think that it needs to be very early on that you involve. Um, you involve the school system, but early in the, early in the students' learning, such as in middle school, not just high school. That, um, you know, by the time uh, folks are in high school, they've already got their eyes set on, on leaving, perhaps, if that's what they're going to do. If you can get them um, geared into particular jobs and um, in manufacturing and things like that early on, such as getting them involved in robotics teams and other things, that they can start to really see that there's an opportunity to um, stay into work and to earn a really good wage. Um, and all levels have something to share in both young and old um, from, um, for, for these type of things. Um, we also thought that making a tying um, uh, mentorship up to incentives such as making your graduation or your other certificate certifications require some form of mentorship um, for your graduation would be, um, would be beneficial for, for everybody involved. Um, but the, it, there needs to be buy-in, and it has to start young. So um, 
I, uh, what, what our group came up with was, first of all, you talk, you, there are several funding sources available, but you probably don't know what they are. And, and finding the sources to, to come up with that information is, is the key. And your Small Business Development Center has been crucial. Margie Douglas, where are you? You, you have been crucial in, in helping us too with funding information. And so has our local uh, uh, and, uh, economic development uh, group in the county, in Tazewell County. And you know, it's pretty standard. I mean, you have to just be creative. You've got your private capital, your grants, your public uh, funding uh, from banks and financial institutions, private investors, equity funding, government funding. Um, and then as you develop, you know, you can use the apprenticeships and also bartering system in with other businesses to help with you growing your business. But that's not really a, a funding mechanism, but it helps as you develop your business to not require so much funding. Thank you. So our group had the assignment of facilitate how to make our next great thing, similar to the Eureka Ranch approach. So we looked up Eureka Ranch approach, <laughs> and it's about innovation engineering. <clears throat> so from that point, we'll, we'll, I'll start with what our game plan, that what we're recommending for innovation engineering in our region, and that is to go back to an innovation of 75 years ago, which was winning World War II. So if you think back to President Roosevelt, he had the task of convincing the citizenry to support an entry into the European theater in World War II. He took two years to, to make that conviction happen among the American populace. So the parallel for us is people understanding that we've got to do this. Per our earlier discussion about do we really understand the economic situation we're in. So there's that aspect. The other aspect of the strategy of World War II was, was then General Eisenhower, who had to unite disparate interests on his leadership team, which would have been generals and presidents and foreign governments under this same shared vision of not just obliterating what was going to threaten the world, but how do we do that together? So that's why we're calling it kind of benchmarking the D-Day approach and coming up with something like that for our region. Our sponsor would be, th these are all hypothetical, but so for example, a sponsor could be the company I work for, New People's Bank, could maybe sponsor this process. Uh, the leaders of it could be our Southwest Virginia, Southwestern Virginia Technology Council in concert with the Workforce Development Board. We're sitting at this table, so, and it could be other groups. It could be the planning districts. It could, you know, that, it's that kind of thinking. The members would be, um, to parallel what you guys were saying, would be from all different interest groups or constituencies or leaders, but it could be the people on that panel, the companies that, that talk to us from the panel, could be, could be the members of that council. Success factors on a D-Day approach would be defining measurable outcomes and measuring. So what, if we have this shared vision, what are the performance measures on reaching that? What are the dates? What are the specific outcomes? And another success factor is the aspect of collaboration. That if we agree that this is what we're doing, we're all in. And President de Gaulle might fight it, or at that time General de Gaulle, but he's going to have to, there's going to be negotiation with him, between him and Eisenhower, for example but everybody's on that same page. The challenges is that common goal and people being willing to negotiate from their position and put the region first. Um, and the second aspect or, or a challenge is, can we 
can we unite under some sort of a final, final decision-making personage slash team? Who's in charge? And do we trust who's in charge to do this? And do we align under the, those are the, those are the challenges. So that's us, D-Day, 75 years ago. <laughs> We'll do one more. Okay, so we have the assignment establishing regional planning board uh, composed of all stakeholders, uh, industry led. I think someone else had that same one. Um, I'm not going to repeat all the things that the other team mentioned. Uh, certainly, we want this to be industry led, so we would have a business representative as the leader from the coal and manufacturing industry. Um, all those partners, the high schools, community college, Southwest Virginia Tech Council, workforce system partners, um, but also uniquely, we would like to have high school students who are in CTE programs from all seven counties represented in the school. So every time it meets, those representatives who are youth are there in the room. Um, so we would start out with, you know, communication, sharing that communication out in a very positive way, and that has to start with a strong marketing campaign. Step two would be managing and resolving problems as they come up so that those problems don't become huge mountains that can't be surmounted. And in doing that, we want this to be a, a three-person partnership that includes one person from business, one person from the workforce system at large, and one youth. So that youth has an opportunity to come alongside business and community partners to resolve those problems. Um, they'll be able to think outside of the box. Um, but also want our locality. So every person that's on this committee, we want them to contribute in some tangible, measurable way to the initiatives of everybody else. So for instance, if one county is doing something, even if that doesn't affect your county or your high school, you put something in, whether that's funding, physical labor, measured by your presence, um, you help with marketing and promotion, you get involved in a long-term project, so if it's something bigger, you stay with it for the long term, um, and perhaps you even help with data collection, because we all have to report on those outcomes. Um, and then finally, we want to track the success of these efforts and measure them as they're in progress and not just wait until the end. So we need to find some way to do that. Hey, Stephanie, we want you to go ahead and wrap up. Yeah. Does anybody else have any more of these sheets that I can collect? I was going to pass to that on these now. And I do want to thank everybody so much. I'm very so very busy for coming out today. And just to kind of revisit the purpose of today is for all those individuals that showed up at any one of our roundtables since we first began, because we said we would have one big finale, those who attended, remember, that we would share all the results. So we wanted to accomplish that today. Um, in addition, to share some of our good news about the impact that we have received just from the 10 businesses that have reported back, but also get groups of leaders like you in the room to really share exactly what we do if we work together. Um, I'm, I've been very honored to work with all the partners that we have with the, under the ARC funding because it's partners that are doing what they're already doing. And it's just connected businesses to it. I think we've done well, but I believe we can do even better. Um, I, I think that we still sometimes have some uh, sand, the lines in the sand drop a little bit. Um, and I hate that. It, it drives me nuts. Um, and sometimes I think my intent to reach across those lines are not always well received or seen in anything but the best of intentions. But I have been very honored and see the progress of collaboration. And we want to take these notes, we're gonna type them up, we're gonna get them out to folks. But I would love to see some of these get some meat to them. Um, I do wanna just highlight a couple of things, and I know we're past time. Um, Todd Elswick um, talked about workforce challenges. We had a little get together. And um, I know that they're working with McKenna County Schools Career Technical Center and they're working on an apprenticeship program. They're gonna take those students right and an apprenticeship means they're employed. And they'll have a job and they know that job's there. And we gotta do more of that. We have Melinda Leland with Ignite. You know, we heard earlier about opportunities for kids to job shadow and do internships. And Ignite has uh, began recruiting businesses and students are out. 
and they're actually getting a job shadow and get to see what some of these jobs are. Because the folks are right. They don't know. They don't know what they see in media or on Facebook. Um, I know that Southwestern Hemlock for Manufacturing, we spend a lot of effort trying to get kids and parents and teachers and uh, career coaches out into the facilities. Because those are our soldiers who can keep passing on the message. There are great jobs here. We do really do need a more direct link between a young age, through high school, right to employment. And with our education system, they can continue on through the community college and a four-year degree and even access to a master's degree. Um, so I love Southwest Virginia and anything that I can do to contribute, I do and I will. And I, I really did want to thank you all so much for showing up today and thank you for your work. Thank you.